welcome to Daily Debrief from People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya and today we talk about a Bolivian court sentencing Janine Añez, former coup leader and de facto president. The People's Summit in the United States and the PGA Tour suspends 17 players for participating in Saudi-backed live tournament. Janine Añez, former de facto president of Bolivia, has been sentenced to 10 years in prison. A court has found she made decisions contrary to the constitution. Añez came to power in a 2019 coup that overthrew legitimately elected President Evo Morales. She left office the following year after Luis Arce of Morales' party, MAS, won the presidential election. Her trial was due to begin in February, but it was postponed. We'll talk to Prashant from People's Dispatch about the development. Prashant, first of all, could you tell us about the timeline of this issue as well as the charges against Anyas? Right. So, uh, I mean, the timeline, like you said, starts with the 2019 coup. Uh, Morales winning the election. At that point, a chorus of voices led by the Bolivian far-right and widely backed, we'll come to that later, by the Organization of American States, you know, pronounces that his election is a fraud based on some theories which later proved to be false. Now, then there is mass violence, large-scale violence, at which point Eva Morales, to preserve the fabric of Bolivia, the you know, social fabric, to prevent large-scale violence, decides to leave the country, and Johnny Nanez becomes the president. Now, the important thing to note is uh, her conviction right now in what is called uh, coup d'etat case number two mm -hmm. is based precisely on her assumption of power because it says that uh, she's found guilty of breach of duties and resolutions contrary to the constitution and law because she was the second vice president of the Senate. The decision to make her president have, took place in a, um, I think, meeting without quorum as well. So it was patently unconstitutional. It was an uh, assumption of power which was paved by military and police authorities, by right-wing authorities. She was, in some senses, the face of the coup as the person who took power and proclaimed, you know, and took some of the earliest steps which uh, was about, tried to basically say that the age of Morales and the movement for socialism, that the MAS party, that it's time uh, was over basically and they took some very, uh, for instance, the traditional indigenous flag that was removed out of many banners and the Bifala it is called. And so many other steps in later months as well, human rights violations, so many things happened. So, uh, she basically presided over all that, a very disastrous COVID-19 response, but also a lot right. of human rights violations during her time. There have been very consistent uh, reports on many of these in terms of sexual crimes, in terms of, uh, you say, torture, in terms of uh, killings and all that kind of stuff. The most famous, uh, infamous examples are the Sakaba and Senkata murders, which took place in November 2019. I believe about uh, close to uh, 25 people or 30 people who were killed around that time. Many other in instances, people who protested or uh, took to the streets were, uh, you know, repressed very heavily. Uh, a law was passed which gave large-scale immunity to the security forces who were actually repressing these protests. And there was, of course, a disastrous handling of COVID-19. So, all in all, although she was in power as a de facto coup president for a very short time, the kind of, uh, you know, horrible disruption she brought to society, she and the government brought to society were quite, uh, you know, qu quite remarkable in that sense. And uh, I think in that, so basically this is, of course, one uh, case, there are many more cases against her. And she is, of course, she and along with some civil police and military officials have been uh, convicted. Now there's been a demand that many more uh, people, you know, former presidents, uh, governors, key social leaders who actually from the right wing who were part of fomenting this crisis should also be in the docks. That's still maybe in the process, might take some time. It's a long process. But nonetheless, it's a very historic moment because it marks a very clear rejection of that 2019 coup which took place in Bolivia. And it also sort of symbolizes a maturing of the process uh, with the victory of Luis Arce, the fact that they're trying to bring people to justice. So there's some amount of unhappiness at the term. She's been sentenced to 10 years in prison. There have been people, you know, the people, a lot of protesters on the streets, the relatives of the victims, those who suffered in various ways, saying that this is not enough, it should be much more. But there are also people who are hopeful that this is just one case, there are many more to go, and true justice will be delivered. Okay, uh, Prashant, now the 2019 coup was also seen as being backed by the United States, and yet we have this conviction. Um, is that a rare occurrence? Right, so it, it's a, it's, it actually is a remarkable testimony to the power, the resilience, the resistance of Bolivian social movements who within a very short time were able to reverse a coup which clearly had the backing of some of the really powerful countries in that region. We know I told you, I mentioned about the OAS. The OAS is very much an instrument of US foreign policy in the region, you know, and, you know, there was, there was a very strong racist component 
to this whole coup that uh, the coup that took place, a lot of violence took place against indigenous protesters, indigenous uh, people, indigenous movements. But it is a uh, you know it is a, it is really it says something about the movements that they continue to fight back, they continue to resist, they continue to mobilize. The MAS party, despite suffering considerable amounts of repression, stayed on track, kept their campaign going, and under Louis Arce and David Chakohanka, who's the vice president right now, they managed to mount a victorious campaign in the face of huge amounts of adversity because. The right wing was ruling in power, and they were determined in some way or the other to prevent MAS from coming uh, back to power. Right. So, despite all these, uh, say, forces working against him, despite this whole information complex, which you know kept portraying Evo Morales as this authoritarian dictator in some way or the other, right. although he's won, you know, although his election victories are for all to see, and the changes he's brought in policy are so evident in terms of realities on the ground. Despite that, there was this global campaign in some senses to portray him as this, you know, one of those evil dictator types. So, despite all this, the Bolivian movements kept, uh, you know, kept working, kept resisting and they were able to reverse that. And once they were able to reverse it, I think the government has also sort of tried its best to sort of continue Morales policies on one hand, to bring more accountability to those, uh, you know, involved in the coup and to you know, uh, and not to sort of, uh, which is very important, I think, not to compromise in any way with those sections in the sense of, okay, you did what you did, now let's forget and move on. Okay. It's not really the policy that government has followed because bringing someone like Johnny Nanez, who is a former president technically, uh, to trial itself is symbolic. Like I said, there's been a demand for even more, uh, some very important leaders like, for, like former presidents, they should also be brought to trial. We'll have to see if that happens. But I think this is a very important uh, you know, lesson for people's movements across the world, for democratic progressive movements across the world to sort of keep struggling on uh, because there was a huge amount of global despondency when Morales was overthrown in 2019 because his government was seen as a uh, beacon of hope, as a positive government. And there was a huge amount of despondency at yet another uh, victory by right-wing forces. Right. But the fact that the Bolivian progressive and left movements were able to come back was, uh, was a very, you know, brought a lot of hope to a lot of people as well. So I think that's a very, a very important, interesting development. Uh, a, a huge blow to the legitimacy of the OAS, which if you ask many people didn't have any legitimacy in the first place. And we are talking about the uh, summit of the Americas next. And then again, the attack on the OAS has been uh, right. very much so. So <clears throat> I think all this together brings, uh, you know, it's a very interesting story in recent times of how uh, people's movements have actually won a major victory. All right, Prashant, thanks a lot for your time. The People's Summit, which began in Los Angeles on June 8, concluded on Friday, June 10. It coincided with the Biden administration's Summit of the Americas, but it presented a far more radical agenda and a message of hope and struggle. For three days, people's movements and activists from across the Americas and other parts of the world discussed a host of issues, analyzed the structural reasons for it, and presented a vision of hope and genuine change. The summit also presented a vital critique of the policies of the U.S. and the Organization of American States, which held the Summit of the Americas. Natalia Marquez of People's Dispatch has a roundup of what happened over the past three days. So I was able to attend the three-day People's Summit for Democracy in Los Angeles. The People's Summit for Democracy was organized as a counter-summit to the Summit of the Americas, hosted by the United States and organized by the U.S.-influenced Organization of American States. So the Summit of the Americas has historically been a place for the United States to lay down its own agenda for the countries of the Americas, with very little input from the working and poor people of those countries. And so the People Summit was put on as an alternative to that, as a place where people from across the Americas, um, you know, regular working people could play a role in the discussions around the policies that would directly affect them. Um, but at the, end, at the end of the day, the People's Summit was way more than an alternative summit. It was actually like a call to action and a vision of something entirely new that people of the Americas could build together. Um, this was really shown in the dedication of the volunteers and organizers of the People's Summit who, you know, the night before the People's Summit were working and building until 11 p.m., only to come back at 6 a.m. the next day and continue to build um, the People's Summit until its opening at 11.30. Um, you know, these people 
were working day in and day out for months, culminating in the three-day event of the People's Summit, where there was a people's art exhibition, there was musical performances, there was um, vendors, and there were panels of movement leaders from around the Americas who were imparting knowledge of of their experiences building people's movements for the attendees of the People Summit to really learn from. There were also workshops and discussions around issues like policing, labor, and housing, around issues that directly affected working people. And, you know, the Summit of the Americas, on the other hand, was physically fenced off from the working people of the United States. You can't even, you couldn't even get near the Los Angeles Convention Center where it was being held. On the other hand, the People's Summit was completely free and open to the public, and people could participate in these discussions around issues that would directly affect them, rather than letting um, the United States dictate which policies would directly affect them. And so the People's Summit ran for three days. Um, there were really inspiring discussions in panels. Um, and this last day, um, on Friday, was really um, incredible to see. Early in the morning, volunteers mobilized right directly in front of the Los Angeles Convention Center to confront the, the organizers of the Summit of the Americas with flags of the three countries that were excluded from the Summit of the Americas, uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba, which um, those are countries that the United States is hostile towards, uh, countries that the United States sanctions, countries that the United States blockades. Um, and the people who volunteered and mobilized in front, of the, in front of the Summit of the Americas were challenging that and saying that these were imperialist policies. Um, this was before the People's Summit even began. When it formally began, the discussions were incredible. Um, the day ended with special messages from the presidents of Venezuela and Cuba and Evo Morales, the former president of Bolivia, who really gave inspiring special messages that attendees were really glad to see. Um, and Finally, the organizers of the People's Summit read um, a final declaration issued by the People's Summit around the different events that occurred. And then after was the big mobilization that, that organizers had been preparing for for three days, where all guests, attendees, volunteers, and organizers, and coordinators of the People's Summit marched as a collective back to the Los Angeles Convention Center where people heard from immigrant rights leaders, from refugees, from US-based organizers and organizers across Latin America, um, challenging the pro-US dominated ideas that were being presented at the Summit of the Americas. Um, and that's how the day ended. People mobilized, there was a call to action, and I think that the significance of that ending is that their organizers emphasized throughout the event that there is work to be done, and it is the responsibility of the peoples of the Americas to build the world that they want to see. And so ending with a direct action was powerful. The PGA Tour, the body which organizes major golf events, has suspended 17 high-profile players who decided to participate in the Saudi Arabia-backed live tournament. The PGA says the human rights record of the Saudi regime is the reason for the suspension. Some players had resigned their PGA Tour membership before the action. We'll talk to Siddhant Ani about this development. Hi, Siddhant. Welcome. Um, Siddhant, it's been a season of boycotts and suspensions, but this one seems strange. Uh, why is the PGA Tour opposed to a Saudi-backed uh, tour? 
Yeah, it's a great question because the PGA Tour actually sanctions or who sanctions events on the Asian Tour, on the Japanese Tour, on the European Tour, uh, all kinds of tours that are uh, run by... Uh, so, so there's a good line I read somewhere that golf is not the people's game, it's the people like us game. So, so I think uh, the kind of uh, this explosion of uh, sentiment that has come out when at the opening of this uh, this Saudi backed Saudi sponsored league, which is ridiculous, by the way, the kind of money that they're talking about. Uh, I mean, it's I don't know what you would like to call this. It's not sport for sure. Uh, the the hundreds of millions of dollars, the richest sort of purses in a sport that already has the most amount of money in the world, right? Uh, so so I don't even want to get into like that part of the conversation. Uh, but but suddenly they're having this sort of outbreak of outrage uh, because pe people who are not like us are taking away some of our top talent, some of our big names, and a, a chunk of our potential to earn money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also striking at the very root of golf, right? This private members only, uh, largely boys club, uh, largely I would say white boys club. Uh, that has a rich history, very deep ties with itself, and essentially is what uh, what runs the the entire you know the mothership. So so it's it's a really interesting conversation, and I, I think because of because it's so much in the English speaking world, uh, the liberal media itself is is very confused about how to deal with this. Uh, there, there is the very real uh, issue of Saudi Arabia's human rights records and, uh, you know, press, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, all of those things. But, but the, the, uh, to use that as the shoulder to fire your bullet, when actually your intent is completely different, is not only disingenuous, it's like assuming that people who are reading or consuming this are absolutely incapable of understanding anything about how the world works. Yeah, but the players can still go to the US Open. So what is this suspension? What does it entail exactly? So, see, what it entails is basically sponsor commitments. <laughs> Hundreds of millions right, right on the appearance of certain players at these events, right? And then around those events, there are, there are many sub-events. And the US Open is, is a major event. Essentially, all of these events that happen in golf are held at these private clubs, right? So they are, in that sense, independent private events. They choose to okay. be part of a tour uh, because it's in everyone's interest, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, any of them can fit, and that's the argument of the players who joined this live tournament, that they earn a living out of uh, playing golf. So it's their livelihood. And, you know, they simply have to fly private planes everywhere they go. It's, it can't be helped. So, so because it's this attack on their livelihood, they should be allowed the freedom to play everywhere and for whoever they want, as long as you know they're doing a lot of their own free will. Fair enough. Uh, so, so that is the player's argument. Actually, uh, there will be some kind of compromise reached because if players like Phil Mickelson, Sergio Garcia, they are talking about some some younger players, players like Rory McIlroy. Uh, you know, guys who are at the top of the game right now, if they don't, if they stop showing up at PGA events, the tour loses a lot of value, a lot of money. Right. So they will reach some sort of compromise, I think. Uh, they Because there's so much money on the Saudi side, they can't shut it down. Uh, they've met their okay. match in that sense. So, so it's really great fun to see these guys knocking heads, actually. <laughs> All right, Sidhan, thank you. Thanks for that update. And that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Please come back to us tomorrow. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And for more updates and analysis from around the world, visit peoplesdispatch.org.